Well, it's a wonderful Thursday afternoon, and I have to say I'm, I'm feeling pretty happy today because I have the great pleasure of sitting down with Trey Anthony. Trey Anthony, welcome to the Amani Project. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Can I just tell you that you just you just made my Thursday? I'm just going to tell you oh. straight <laughs> up. You, you just you you made my you made my Thursday. Well, thank you. I'm glad about that. <laughs> and I almost said Wednesday because you yes. know. Let's face it. We've we've been spending a lot of time at home over the course of the past couple of, of years, and so, you know, sometimes I'm forgetting which yes. day. Which lose, day it is. We lose track. We definitely lose track. Yeah, we do. So I would love to start by by doing a check-in. How how is Trey Anthony on this day? How are you feeling? Oh, wow. How have you been doing? I've been really well. Um, I think I'm one of those people that people get a little bit annoyed at because I just feel really good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I've been really <laughs> invested in, you know, my own well-being and peace. Mm. And I'm currently right now working out of Tampa. And, um, so the sunshine really helps, I think, with my mental health and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a good palm tree always makes you feel good about yourself. So I'm pretty good. I'm a little bit tired because I have a two-year-old now who is, yeah, um, the terrific twos are a real thing. <laughs> so that's the only thing that's keeping me a little bit tired. But apart from that, I'm really good. I love the fact that you said terrific twos and not terrible twos. Yes, no, I, I speak <laughs> into existence. <laughs> yes. Right? If there's anything that I learned from my yes. mama, speak yes. it into existence. Yes. Speak yes. it into existence, yes. yes. I hear so you with that. Thing. It's a real thing. He's as terrific as possible. Oh, <laughs> so. I love that. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Oh, that's so wonderful. And now, okay, so the palm trees, I'm down with the palm trees. Yes. I, I'm seated, of course, in Toronto, downtown Thank Toronto. You. No yes. palm trees. I know this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no palm trees, as you know, right? But uh, but yeah, I'm going to live a little vicariously through you, if that's okay, okay. with the palm no, trees. Yes, no problem. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> So, you know, in asking how you've been doing, Trey, and, and I'm finding that a lot of times when I'm sitting down with individuals and artists in, in particular this past season, a lot of us have been talking about our self-care and our wellness and how we're doing and prioritizing that, uh, especially now. And so I'm so curious in hearing you starting off with that what is what is Trey doing now to take care of self can you share some of those practices I, I'm curious Trey give me the, give yes, me the 411 yes. I would definitely say the best thing and the biggest thing is um water like you've got to stay hydrated that's a big thing for me so I make sure I'm drinking a lot of water um, and my water also includes like herbal teas um, that really starts my day really well. Um, sleep. Um, I have a habit. My son goes down at eight. I go down at 930. And that's kind of I really need my sleep. I'm a better person when I'm sleeping. Um, I really try and limit myself to any kind of news that doesn't feel good. So I don't watch the news. I try and really limit what I'm um, taking in via social media and any negativity. I'm like, nope, I don't want to read that. Don't want to see that. Don't want to hear that. Um, I run nearly every single day, pretty much. So mm. that has been something that has really helped um, jogging for me. So I run about 5K a day. So that has really helped. Um, meditation, um, checking in with God and the universe first thing in the morning, keeping my phone out of my bedroom. That's a good thing. Um, writing, journaling, um, checking in with friends, like your people, whoever your people is, I try and do that at least once a day. And, and checking in for me doesn't mean a text. It doesn't mean liking a picture on Facebook. It means actual calling and seeing people. And that is something that I think is extremely important. And, you know, I wrote a whole damn book on self-care, you know, Black Girl in Love with Herself. So for me, I feel I have to practice what I preach. Um, and I really believe in the well-being of Black women. It's really important to me and essential to me. So for me, it's something that I really guard my well-being. I really mm -hmm. do. My health. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. You know, I, this is one of my favorite things to talk about, to talk about our self-care. I'm excited about the book, by the way. I'm excited. I have to get my copy. I'm very excited about the book. I know, I know about the book. Thank you. Um, and talking about self-care is is one of my favorite things to to open up about because I do think that as I've looked over the course of the past many years and even looking at my own practice of self-care, I think a lot of times when I was younger, as a younger artist, um, you know, a lot of times, Trey, for me, the idea of self-care meant go to sleep. Yes. <laughs> uh, right. That that was self-care. But as I've gotten older and started to get into, you know, my 20s and then my 30s and then my 40s, I start to realize, well, whoa, wait a second. Self-care is yeah. much more than just taking a nap and going to sleep at night. It's mm-hmm. the things that you've mentioned that yeah. you've just shared. Right. And finding ways to offer. I really think that self-care is self-love. And it's, it's an offering of self-compassion, compassion for self. And so yes. I love, love, love what you've just shared. I think it's, it's important for us to be intentional. Very intentional. That. Yes, very intentional. Because I think especially as women, and especially if we're working women, and especially if we're mothers or we're doing any kind of um, taking care of others, we put ourselves last. And so it mm. has to be a very intentional practice, right? Because everybody is put, you know, on the top of our list except ourselves. And so for me, I always say none of this is going to get done unless I'm feeling well, right? So that's how I really function from that place of I have to put myself first before anybody else. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I feel a part two conversation coming up in our future about self-care. I love that. I do. And so can I also, um, I'd like to now talk about, can, let's talk to baby Trey for just a moment. Yes. Let, let's take a step back if we can, because I'm, I'm really curious to know when, you know, you look back, Trey, all that you've accomplished, the many beautiful things that you have accomplished, um, and you look back at your journey, can you share, how did you get started And did you even know that the work that you're doing now is what you wanted to do as a young human? How did you get started in in the industry? It's a great question. Um, I started um, really by doing a lot of sketch comedy. Um, I knew from high school, I had a really amazing teacher, uh, Ms. Horvat, um, in drama, um, who really supported me and really um, inspired me and gave me the foundation to say that I could be an artist and that I had talent. And so that was something that I knew from the get-go. Um, I also knew, and being really realistic, that there wasn't a lot of women who looked like me on TV who was doing theater. And so for me, it really was about creating my own work and also to, even if it wasn't about if I was going to get cast in something, it was also what I was getting cast in and what I was seeing in theater and in comedy wasn't really speaking to me. And I had always Mm -hmm. been very influenced by being um, a Black Canadian of West Indian heritage, um, my parents and grandmother being Jamaican. And so I used to really crack people up a lot in high school where I would, you know, imitate my grandmother or my mother or, you know, and back in the day, I went to a Catholic high school and there was, you know, the black table. Everybody knows the black table in the cafeteria, right? (laughs) And, And there was probably about 12 of us in that high school at that time. And I used to just, it was just kind of the sense of community and I would crack on jokes about like how lunch looks different for us as black people like what we would bring for lunch right like when your mother is you know packing up you know the rice and peas with you know the time in it and the white <laughs> color <laughs> you know? I like, could relate sandwiches, right and your mother's like you know giving you a thermos full of um, soup right so I was always one, yeah, just making those jokes. <laughs> and so I knew I was funny in the way people was relating to that. And I also knew that there was something that was missing in mainstream comedy is that actual look at 
what it feels like to be like a first generation Canadian, right? And our experiences differ, right? You know, like we weren't allowed to go to sleepovers, right? That kind of stuff. We weren't allowed to talk back to our parents. So those were the things that I started making jokes about. And then I got into my first community play. I did this play called um, Green is the Color of Spring. And there was this comedian who came out, Tarandella. And Tarandella came to watch it. And she said to me, you have great comedic timing. Mm. And she said, have you ever thought about doing stand-up? And I was like, stand-up? Like, no. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> like, I like telling jokes to my friends and imitating my family. But I didn't see myself as a stand-up comic who could right. tell jokes. And then she said to me, there's this um, night called the Nubian Nights at Yuck Yucks. And she said, there's a man there named Kenny Robinson who does this all black um, show every single um, month. And I think it was the last Sunday or last Saturday of every month. And she said, he pays $50 for a 10 minute set. And to me, it sounded like 50,000. Right? I, like, <laughs> I was like, $50 for 10 minutes. Right? I was just like, this is amazing. Like, where do I start? Like, I'll come up with something. Like if it's 10 minutes, and I think looking back now, I was so glad I was this naive that mm. I didn't know that the Nubian shows had the reputation of like booing your ass off stage if you weren't funny. And especially with women, they had this thing of like black women aren't funny, women aren't funny. And I went in there really just kind of naive, kind of just really excited, just focusing on getting my $50 after 10 minutes. And I just went up there and I talked about my family. I talked about my friends. You know, I talked about being Jamaican and people just started laughing. And I think if I had gone previously and seen what they had done to other comics, I don't think I would have done the show. But because I had no idea what it was, I was just like, oh, I can do this. And that's really how I became a regular. And I created the character called Carlene, the dance hall queen. And that was based on like this dance hall character and that became very popular and I would do the Nubian shows. And then Kenny got a show called After Hours with Kenny Robinson, which was on the Comedy Network for CTV. And he asked me to come along and write for that show and also star in it. And that's really how I got quote unquote, my big break was from that. That's how it all started really was doing those comedy shows, then writing for the Comedy Network. And then I started to feel a bit pigeonholed. Um, and I thought I was being only seen as the comedy girl and the funny girl. And I wanted mm -hmm. to do more dramatic stuff. And that's when um, I realized I wasn't being cast as that. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to write my own stuff. And that's how I started writing The Kink in My Hair came from that, was the, the whole idea of trying to blend fact and fiction of my life, but also being dramatic and also having the comedic elements from my own previous work, but also exploring something new. And The Kink in My Hair was my first play that I'd ever written. Um, I never knew it was going to be the thing that would put me on the map for theater and TV, but that's really what it became. And it became out of this necessity of, wanting to see theater and going to theater and not seeing myself on stage and not seeing black stories told in an authentic way. And yeah. I was like, I want to do what, you know, I want to create a play that I would want to go to because I didn't think that mainstream theater was talking to me as a young black woman at that time. I was just like, let me do my own. And so I had, I think with everything, I've always had this level of audacity and not really knowing that there's actual steps and a process and I'm kind of like oh I think I can do that yeah I think I can do that and I think I could do it better than the way they're doing it right and so that's really what has led me yeah in all everything that I've done yeah yeah but I, I like that I love that because I do think that you know oftentimes when I'm I'm sitting down with other artists what I often hear is that we we plan a lot Many of us will plan. We think that, okay, it has to look this specific way. But I, I am enjoying what you're sharing because sometimes it's just a matter of just, just going for it. 
just, and seeing what happens, <laughs> you know, trust in the Lord and just going for it. <laughs> you know, and that is something that, you know, I just recently did a talk on IG and I was talking about people making all of these goals and resolutions for the new year. And I said, how many of us stop ourselves because we want it to be perfect? And I said, a friend said to me, what are the secrets of your success? And I said, I think the biggest secret has been I've never worried about it being a 10. I just mm-hmm. always worried that I wasn't going to get it out there. So when everybody's sitting still and thinking how they can make it a 10, and then because they don't have the right resources or the right connections or the right camera or the right look, it stops them. I'm like, okay, well, I'll work with what I got and I'll put it out as an eight. And then the eight will then move on to a nine and 10 because then I'll do it again and again and again until I get to a 10. So I said, I've always just been the person who executes. I don't think about it. I'm just like, I'm going to execute and we'll mm-hmm. see where it lands, right? And so I think that has been the thing that a lot of us as artists, and I think especially as women, that we stop ourselves and think of all of the things that are missing or all of the things that we are told that we don't have to complete the process instead of looking at the things that we do have. And that's has been my thing. I'm always like, okay, what do I have that I can start? That's a great lesson. Listen, where were you when I was eight years old? Because (laughs) where were you? Because this idea of perfectionism is something that so many of us, including myself, learned at a very young age. And it does it does delay you. It, It can potentially delay you from walking into, you know, your purpose. It can delay you from being able to do that because you're right. You're sitting back and you're thinking about the 10. Is is everything set in place? Do I have the right funding? Mm -hmm. Am I with the right team? Am I with the right people, the camera, et cetera? So absolutely, I hear you Mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, yeah. And I think about how many times it's actually delayed me from walking in to the things that I need to do. But I'm grateful for maturity, Trey. I'm grateful for getting older because then you get to a point where you're like, okay, you know what? I'm okay with this being a six today. (laughs) I'm okay with starting off with a six because I know it will get to the 10. It will get to the 10. Definitely. (laughs) Exactly. And that's what it is. It's just about starting. And that's what I say to so many of, um, I mentor a lot of youth and I say, just start, just start. Like if it means putting, you know, a YouTube channel up, if it means getting an Instagram page, if it means putting out a couple of TikTok videos, just start. Right. And so that has been, I think, the biggest wisdom I feel I can pass on to people. It doesn't have to be perfect. That's good. That's so good, Trey. Can I talk about the let's starting part too? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because, you know, oftentimes I, I do hear uh, younger artists who will say, well, I don't, I don't know where to start. I understand I have to just start, but I don't know what to do. And I don't even know if I have the skill set to do it. So I wanted to preface my next question by saying that to you, because when you look back at that, you were talking about the comedy part yeah. and then talking about the kink, which I so, the kink of my hair, which I so enjoyed turning on my television and watching, you know, and, and being there as well to go uh, and see the play in person. Mm-hmm. Um, where, what do you say to that individual that desires to just start, but mm-hmm. they don't know what just starting looks like? Yeah, it's funny. I just had this conversation yesterday with a a new mentee who was asking me about breaking in to theater and that she wants to do theater. And I said to her, I think what we get really caught up in is this idea of I need the perfect job. And I think what has really served me a lot too is humility, right? Of volunteering, doing a lot of stuff that I wasn't getting paid for, um, you know, I did a lot of internships. Um, I built a lot of relationships by that. Um, I also worked really hard in jobs that I wasn't getting paid for. And you don't know who is going to end up somewhere who is going, I always say to people like your reputation precedes you, right? So you always should treat every, especially in this industry, like the person who's bringing your coffee tomorrow could be the exact, like, <laughs> like two days from now. You just don't know, right? So it always serves you to treat everybody really well. It also serves you to work really hard because people have conversations about you 
that you have no idea about even before you enter the room. So I always say that, you know, be able to look up a community theater, look up a Soul Pepper theater, a bigger name theater, ask, like, are they looking for volunteers? Um, I can't tell you how many people have worked with me as volunteers who I've ended up hiring, you know, like my whole executive team right now, all of my producers are people who started out as either volunteers or contract workers, and I've seen their work ethic and they have grown with me, right? And so that is something that I tell um a lot of people who are breaking into the industry because I think people don't want to be humble, right? So they're kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, well, I, that's not what I want to do. I'm like, I want to go get coffee. I don't want to, um, and I t- tell people this, one of my first jobs in the industry actually too was I was an intern on the Chris Rock show, right? And I remember thinking, oh, well, I'll get on the Chris Rock show and Chris Rock is going to see me and he's going to put me in the sh- you know, his show and he's going to be like, oh, you're so damn funny. And there I was, you know, it was the hot heat in New York. And my job was to sit in the van with no air conditioning and guard the camera equipment, right? That was my job, right? My job that I wasn't getting paid for. Then I would drop off Chris Rock's dry cleaning. You know, I would buy and get a lot of coffee, all of those things. But what you see is preparing you because you're also seeing how things are getting done, right? So I think when I say to people to just start, I I talk about volunteering. I talk about making contacts. Um, I talk about, I can't tell you how many times when I teach a writing course and I ask some of the writers, upcoming writers, so what are you reading? And I'm shocked when they were like, oh, I I don't read. Like, (laughs) like, like I don't have a favorite, Uh. you know, author or playwright. And I'm kind of like, but you want to be a writer. So I don't understand how you're not reading. Like something as simple as that is affecting your craft. You know, Mm -hmm. um, I have people right now in one of my um, groups who want to be a TV writer. And one of the first things I said to them is watch TV and tell me what shows are resonating with you, what you like and what you don't like, right? Because that's the way to get your brain thinking. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, looking at scripts, looking at TV and saying, oh, I like this show or that show, right? And I always say to people, I wish when I started, there was a YouTube and a Facebook and an Instagram that was around. So now you don't, you can even cut out the middle person. Like when you look at someone like Issa Rae, right? Who started on YouTube with her own channel and look at her now, right? We didn't have, and and if you look at some of her um, earlier stuff, you're like, oh my dear God, but she started, right? It wasn't perfect, but she started. And so I always say um, to people who are starting, like, what's stopping you from, you know, opening, putting up a new YouTube channel? What's stopping you from um, saying, let me go on Instagram? What's stopping you from um, opening up a page on LinkedIn and starting to, you know, Google some companies that you want to work with, right? But I think people are under this impression that it's going to come to you. And I don't know of anybody that just kind of shows up and people say, oh, you, you want to be a star? Okay, here you go. <laughs> I don't think it happens. I don't know of anyone, right? So it's a level of work. It's a, a level of commitment. And one of the biggest things that I do to this day is still listen to artists of how they start. Like one of the things I do right now, like on my um, um, audio book account, um, I listen to, like I'm listening right now to the Will Smith memoir. I was listening to the memoir. I listened to the Jay-Z memoir. So it's really good for you to hear um, the Whoopi Goldberg memoir. Like I listened to how people started and what kept them going. And I think that is something that we don't do is just that research of how people got started. Because I think Instagram and Facebook makes you think it's all really instant, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Until you hear people's stories and you're like, oh my God there was an actual work ethic involved in this. Yes. Yeah. And hardships and so many different things that, that happened before we actually saw the greatness that we're seeing on our televisions, (laughs) right. From all of these artists. Like it's, it's, you don't see the hardship. I remember even when we were in development for the kink in my hair and Gozi Paul and I used to ride our bikes to 
the actual TV station, right? To go and meet with the execs because we didn't have money for bus fare. And I remember I would be peddling behind and go see, this was our running joke. She used to say, I used to always go, and go see how much money do you think we're going to make when this show gets made? And she'd say, I don't know, Trey, but it's going to be a lot. <laughs> she would go, I don't know, Trey, but I know that we will be able to get bus fare, right? <laughs> But you know, right. what you see is, oh, Trey, Anthony, and Ngozi Paul created the Kink in My Hair, and they had their mm. own TV show, and Trey Anthony was the first Black woman to have her own TV show, but you don't know the kind of things that we went through. We didn't have bus fare. We were riding mm. to meetings to talk about our show on our bikes. Wow. Right? Yeah. So it's things like that. Like, you don't know people's stories and what they went through to get yeah. to where they got to. Absolutely, Trey. And, you know, I feel like all of those moments inform a lot of the work that ends up happening afterwards. Yes. You know, it's the true. life that happened before the stuff mm -hmm. on stage and the stuff on TV yes. um, and the stuff beyond that, all of those, quote unquote, hardships, the challenges, um, mountains. Can I call them mountains? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <You know? Big> mountains. <laughs> boulders you know? <laughs> right they were pebbles right yeah, they were they boulders were not, yeah. right so yeah they they end up informing is that fair to say like ended up informing a lot of what it is that uh, that you do now definitely because you can't um it shapes you it shapes mm. you and it gives you a level of tenacity that I think you realize what you are capable of achieving with less resources than other people. So by the time you get resources, you're just like, oh, this is how it gets done, but I've been doing it this way. And so when you have resources, then it just even gets even better because you know how to make it work with less resources, right? right? And so it does shape you and it makes you, it makes you get a bit more creative, a bit more resourceful, you know, and you have to have that level of tenacity of like, I'm going to make this work with what I have. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And you know, the listening part too, when you share that, um, knowing that you're listening to, you know, to Will Smith and to so many others. I remember Magdalene John, a reporter from Context Beyond the Head Headlines, uh, said, said to me once that one of the best things that we can do as artists, as humans, is listen. Yes. Yes. Just, just, listen. just listen. And sometimes we don't take the time and the opportunity to do that because we're so busy trying to get work done or trying to, to mm -hmm. get ahead. So just the listening. Um, I really appreciate that piece that you share. Just listening and hearing where others have come from, where they have walked from, um, can end up even supporting us in our journey too and mm -hmm. teaching us. Oh, yes, definitely teaching us and just seeing that it didn't happen overnight, even though we yeah. think it happened overnight. There's a lot of, you know, blood, sweat and tears that went into things. You know, I was reading just recently, like the Nipsey Hussle, um, his biography mm -hmm. and just some of the things that he has done and created in his neighborhood. I had no idea of like how Jay-Z started. I had no idea. So all of these things, you know, um, what's his name, Sean Combs or Puff Daddy. He's always changing his damn name. I can't remember, but, you know, knowing that he started as an intern and what he's done, right? All of those things that like, I always try and read people's stories who have inspired me and to do the research on them, to find out how they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask who some of your, your favorites are? You, you mentioned some great ones. Yeah. Who are some would, of those individuals that have inspired you in your journey? I would definitely say, of course, everybody knows I love me some Oprah, right? So there's nothing <laughs> about Oprah that I don't feel like I don't know. Like, I feel like she's my kindred spirit. And I just love her. Like, you know, when you hear about her stuff, of her talking about her growing up in Mississippi and mm -hmm. um, having an outhouse right? And just what she has done and achieved. Um, Jay-Z is definitely a person who I just love what he has been able to create and how he talks about the business of it, right? You know, so I'm always inspired by people who don't just see art as just creative, but also see it as a business, right? Because I think we're one of the few people as artists who believe that we should be broke, right? Or don't get paid mm. for stuff. 
And I've never believed that. I, right. I remember when I told my mom that I was going to drop out of university and pursue art. And she goes, you're going to be broke. You know, you're never going to make any money. right? <laughs> and all of that. And it was one of those things that I was just like, I'm going to prove her wrong. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to make money. You know, my sister right now, um, she has her PhD and I make more money than my sister with a PhD, you know, and that is just the truth because I've always seen it as how can I make this a business and do what I do and also get paid, but also get paid really well for it. Yes. You know? So that has been something that has really made me look at my craft in a different way of that. I deserve to get paid for the work that I do because I also know what I do is really damn good. Yes, it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. It, can I get an amen, please? Yeah. Like I'm just waiting for the congregation to show up. <laughs> yes, right? it is. It yeah. absolutely is fantastic. And you know what? A lot of times when when we think about the context of art, I think a lot of times I, I can relate to that story of, you know, my mother, you know, even telling me, okay, have a backup plan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Have a backup plan. Because if you want to be an artist, uh, I think this whole um, starving artist mentality thing has, has been here for so many generations that when individuals look at the context of art, they don't often think as that artists can also be business people. Yes, yes, yes. And that is a huge thing. And I think one of the big disservices that we do as artists, I think as schools and as they're learning, is not teach the business of the business. We mm. don't teach, we'll teach you how to have really great acting technique. We'll teach you how to structure a play in a TV show, but we don't teach you how to make money from your craft. And that is something that every single course that I teach, I always talk about the business. Like, how can you roll this out so you can make money from what you do. And I think especially as Canadians, we're raised with this level of humility or of like not rocking the boat, not asking for what you want, not asking to get paid. And, you know, and my one of my biggest quotes that people say that I'm known for, I'm like, I don't leave my house for free. I don't leave my house for free. <laughs> I just don't, right? I don't do anything for free. And people know that. So as soon as they call me, I'm like, what's the budget? Let me know what's the budget because you cannot call me without a budget because my time is valuable. Yes. And I see nothing wrong in that. You wouldn't ask a doctor to show up for free, a plumber to show up for free, a teacher to show up for free. Why do you feel as artists we need to show up for free? And why are we embarrassed to demand a living wage, right? <laughs> to say this is actually, it takes me time. And even though it, I make it look easy because I'm so good at what I do, you don't feel that I actually sit down and plan how to write a keynote speech. You don't think I sit down and think about the beats of what goes into a keynote speech. You don't think it takes me time to write an entire damn book, to create a course. You know, all of those things are my time. So I deserve to be compensated for that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness. I, I you know, what's coming to mind is the, the countless times that uh, friends and colleagues of mine have shared that, you know, they, they will get hired, for example, to sing at a wedding or, or write a song. And when they go there, what's being offered, for example, is, you know, $20 or $25. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes nothing, nothing, you know, sometimes nothing. And one of the, the things that's often, that often comes up is that when they're asked or being, uh, or rather, saying, well, this is what I'd like to be compensated for, you know, this five minutes that I'm singing this song, for example. The question often comes back is, well, why so much? You're only singing for five minutes. Yeah, yeah. You're only singing for five. And I remember the conversation that I had with this colleague because they were so frustrated about the fact that it's not the five minutes that we're actually being compensated yes. for. It's the prep time, the writing of that song. It's the taking time to sit down and put the words together. Yeah. It's the, yeah. the emotional and mental strain and responsibility yeah. that it took to actually. So sometimes people don't actually think about all of the work that we're doing as artists before we show up. So we show up and how yeah. we show up at our best, right? Yes. You know, I get that a lot when people ask me to do a keynote and they're like, but you're only talking for 45 minutes. But I'm like, I just don't show up and talk, right? Yeah. Like there's a preparation. <laughs> I'm yeah. actually practicing it before. And you're also paying for my experience, right? And, yes. my experience, and that I'm entertaining your audience. 
So that is what you're paying for. You're not paying for the 45 minutes. You're paying for everything before that. And what I am bringing to entertain and educate your audience, that's what you're paying for. You're paying for my level of expertise in that. It's not 45 minutes. So for you, you're like, oh, wow, you pay. That's how much you charge for a 45 minute keynote. No, it's not just that. I'm charging you for everything before that. Yes. Yeah. Including the, the time it took. I child care. I got I got to yes. put my child oh, yes. in child care in order to do your event. I have yes. to make sure that I am. There are certain things I've got to purchase in order to do your event. So oftentimes I think that's why when we think about, again, that context of of art, sometimes what what maybe it is that is, is there perhaps this consideration that, OK, maybe it just does look easy, like we just show up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, just, and just do it that we were just authentically gifted yeah, right. <laughs> which we are which we are yeah, we just magically show up and then yeah the voice of god comes into us and we're able to perform like it just, it's not like that and i think we yeah. have to start really putting a value on art i think mm. i i think i can't remember where i read this but somebody was saying what has really gotten us through the pandemic has been the artist who have been creative, who have created the books that we're reading, the podcasts that we're listening to, the TV shows that we're watching, right? And going online when, you know, um, they're doing these live, you know, versus events and all of that. It's been the artists that really have kept our sanity through the pandemic. Can you imagine Mm -hmm. if we didn't have artists during this pandemic, what it would look like? I can't even. Right? I I can't imagine. So we really need to place value on what we do. And the society has to realize what we do. We have kept people afloat, basically, on our backs for the last two years now because of this pandemic. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And as a result of that, um, full circle coming back to the self-care part, um, because I, I'm thinking about a conversation that I had with the wonderful Rodney DeVerlis, mm-hmm. uh, who shared... The, the same about artists getting us through this yeah. time. And full circle, I think about the fact that because of the fact that that artists are the ones that are helping, supporting, carrying, guiding individuals through this pandemic, the full circle piece is that we need so much care right now because we're working overtime, yes. overtime in order to carry and guide individuals through. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why we need to really prioritize our health and well-being because so much is taken from us. You know, mm-hmm. um, even me now when I do a keynote and it's virtual, like sometimes people are like, oh, well, I feel like you shouldn't be charging as much as you would charge when you show up. But I mm-hmm. said it's even harder for me to do a virtual keynote because there's no energy coming back for me. Like whereas before I would be feeding off the audience's energy. So to, for me to be on a screen and trying to feel like if I'm really connecting with you, when I come off that Zoom meeting or that keynote, what's on the virtual stage, I feel even more trained than I felt leaving and driving from my house and going in my car and checking into a hotel or flying on a plane to do a keynote. I feel mm-hmm. so trained by that experience because you don't get anything back. You're not feeding off anybody. Right. And I think people don't understand that, especially when you are a person who's used to a live audience, who's giving you something back or you can read the room and see, oh, this is working. This is landing. This isn't. Oh, somebody laughed. This is good. But you just feel like you're talking into this black hole. Right. And so you don't know what's working. Right. Speaking my language. Yeah. Right. So that is why it's so important. And that's one of the things that I do now. Like I tell my executive assistant, anytime I'm doing a keynote, don't book me anything more for that day. Like it's 45 minutes, I know, but I don't want to do anything more after that day because I know how much it emotionally mm. and physically takes from me to hold an audience, you know, vid- uh, virtually, how much energy that takes from me. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I, there have been a lot of uh, talks that I've, I've ended up um, having to transition and do from being doing those in person mm-hmm. and now having to do them online is it's a uh, it's a shift. It really is a shift. And I, I hear you because I've even found that I've had to prepare myself so differently um, because of the fact that I know that when I'm now talking 
online, I am talking to those black boxes, as you said, and not everybody's going to want to turn on their, their camera. Yes. Right? Yes. So, you know, you're, you're having these engagements and you're here potentially in your space at home. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might be by ourselves in our spaces mm -hmm. with absolutely no type of social support, people to hold mm -hmm. on to, to sense their energy and everything that you're saying, Trey, it, it, it feels sometimes so isolated. It is. It is. And that's yeah. why I go full circle back to the checking in piece with your people, because yeah. we do a lot of work in isolation. You know, mm -hmm. I work from home. And so I spend most of my day by myself in front of the computer. Right. And so even when I'm working or doing a workshop or a keynote, a lot of that is by myself. And so that is why it's so important for me to say when I check in with people, I'm actually doing a FaceTime call. Um, you know, my one of the reasons why I um, started to work from Florida is because my mom and sister are here and they're 15 minutes away. So I want to see them because I need that human contact. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling very isolated. Right. So it really is part of that self-help part and self-care part of trying to make sure that you check in with people who nurture you and feed you and you can actually have some kind of eye contact with, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Trey, you're feeding me. You're feeding me this afternoon. You are. This is so good. You know, when we talk about all of this, Trey, and, and just how um, your career has, has journeyed and when you also think about, um, you know, some of those highlights... Mm -hmm. There are there are often times, you know, that I'll sit back and I'll close my eyes and I'll think about some of the wonderful things that I've had the opportunity mm. to be a part of my journey. What's that for Trey? What are some of those highlights when you look back? If we can take a step back and look at those highlights, what stands out for you as you're sitting in your space right now in yeah. Florida with the palm trees? <laughs> You know, I'd love to talk about those highlights. What are some that stand out for you? My biggest highlights have been, um, I remember when we were um, doing marketing and promotions for the kink in my hair. And I remember we went down to Carabana and we were physically giving out flyers because the show hadn't started yet. And I remember, and, and to this day, it's ingrained in my head. There was this little girl and she must have been about eight. And on the flyer was myself and Gozi Paul and Ordina. And she looked at the flyer and she looked up at me and she looked up at Ngozi and then she looked down again and she said, you're on TV? And you could just see like her whole world and imagination just expanded to see Black women on TV, someone who looked like her was on TV. And I will never forget that moment because she was just in such awe of like a girl like me could actually be on TV. And that has been one of the biggest moments that has always stayed in my mind about mm. why I create the work that I create is for other young Black women and girls to know it's possible. Like I came from Rexdale, right? I grew up working class, the Toronto projects, right? My mom had me at 17, right? So the stats weren't, if you look at the stats, I wasn't supposed to be the woman who gets a TV show, mm -hmm. right? So things mm -hmm. like that stay in my mind. I remember also um, when we got the Murfish production gig at the Princess of Wales Theatre. And I remember clearly writing in my contract and saying that we had to make it accessible for people from our community to be able to come. And we had, in every show, I had it written in my contract that 25 tickets would be sold at $20, right? And we did outreach directly to the Black community. And seeing Black people come to the Princess of Wales who had never stepped foot in the Princess of Wales right, was something that to this day, I know we changed the landscape of theater, that for Black people to say, oh, it's for us. Yes, we can dress up and go to the Princess of Wales. That wasn't happening before the kink was there, right? So those have been highlighted moments for me. Um, just today, a woman wrote me and said, I just wanted you to know I was in Barnes and Nobles in the U.S. 
and I saw a black woman on the cover of a book in the self-help. And I just, I didn't even know what your book was about. And she goes, but I just saw you. And I was just like, who is this? And she said, I sat down in the Barnes and Noble. And she said, I just wept. Mm. Because I felt like you were just talking to me. Like the story, everything just resonated with me. And when I read those emails of women who say, this book makes them feel seen and heard, those are things that make me go, okay, I'm I'm standing in my truth. I'm walking in my power because I'm making Black women feel seen and yeah. heard, right? Mm-hmm. And so those are the things um, that make me feel like I'm walking in my purpose, right? Mm-hmm. And that I'm doing something that my son, I hope one day will be like, wow, my mom did that, right? Like my mom did it, you know? And um, I love when women say, when I hear you speak and you talk about asking for money and negotiating contracts and saying, why shouldn't we get paid? Why shouldn't we have luxury? Why should we be embarrassed to say, I actually want to live well? What is wrong with that? It just changes people's mindsets. And for me, that's what I want, for us to know it's possible for us. We're not getting left out of the conversation anymore. It's actually possible for us. Mm. And um, I also love, just recently on Facebook, I wrote, um, it was a Sunday and I was bored at home and I said, how did we meet, right? And I said, just humor me, tell me how we met. And the amount of people on my Facebook page who said, I've never personally met you but I think I know you, or when I met you, one of the things I remember was how you made me feel like you actually treated me like I was important and you didn't know me from anybody, but I just remember that interaction. And I truly do believe that you leave people better than you found them. And so to know that people's memories of me is that I treated them well, that to me makes me go, okay, I'm doing good. Right. Just, and it doesn't matter to me if you're the CEO or the person taking out the garbage, we treat people well with decency because they matter. I just got a shiver. I'm just letting you know I did. <laughs> I got a shiver. I did. And, you know, I'm thinking about the amount of power that we have. This is something that uh, I was sharing with uh, another colleague and a friend of mine, the amount of power that we have tray in our tongue (laughs) to either lift up people or or destroy them and so the leaving people better really stands out for me Mm -hmm. um because in those moments of those first meetings we have the ability to make a person feel good you know and cherished and seen and loved and encouraged and inspired or to make them feel like total trash yes Yes. Like we literally have that power in our tongue yes, to do that. And so many times we choose the ladder. Humans choose the ladder to mm-hmm. destroy and to pull down. And so I, I really am enjoying what you're sharing with regards to how those first experiences, individuals have, that have had their first experiences with you yeah, and how they have felt when they've walked away. I can attest to that because I do oh, remember yes. meeting you. I I'm, I remember meeting you. I remember it was it was so many years ago. It was again. It was at a, a lounge. Uh, wow, Nicole. The, the, I'm trying to remember the the show, but I remember meeting. And I was walking by. I said, "Oh, well, that's Trey Anthony." <laughs> no, I walked myself right back on over, and I was like, "Hi, it's just I'm, I'm Nicole." Hamilton. I wasn't using my middle name at that time. Uh-huh. You know, now now I do. But I'm Nicole Hamilton. So nice to meet you. And you were you were on your way out, but you stopped. It's so nice to meet you too. What's your name again? I was like, Nicole <laughs> Hamilton. And you know, my my parents always told me, you know, you when you shake somebody's hand, you shake with purpose. Yeah, with you know, purpose. don't just don't just give them a limp, limp figured hand. So you yes, sh- so yes. I shook your hand with purpose. And I said, I'm Nicole Hamilton. He said, It's so nice to meet you. I hope that you have a wonderful night. And it was so, yes, yeah, you did make me feel seen and important. I think that's important for us to do as as humans, that you never know if that is the one and only time that you have an opportunity to meet that person Mm -hmm. who could potentially bring you some incredible joy in the moment. 
Exactly. You know? And you know what that person is going through. I talk about this in my book. The one time I bumped into Oprah Winfrey at the Toronto Film Festival, I was coming out of the bathroom, right? <laughs> and she was in the actual washroom, right? And this was a woman who I feel like has shaped my whole entire existence and career. Mm. And I walked out of the bathroom and there was Oprah Winfrey at the sink, washing her hands. And I was like, oh my God. And I just <laughs> like, I turned around and she goes, oh, hi, I'm Oprah. And I was thinking like, oh, they're Oprah. Like everybody knows. Right, Oprah. right. And she shook my hand and she goes, what's mm-hmm. your name? And I was like, I'm Trey Anthony. And then I just like lost my mind, right? I started blabbing and like, like diarrhea out of my mouth. But I remember just how she just looked at me like mm. I mattered and she heard me out mm. and then she was like good luck with everything you're doing I'm so proud mm. of you and it just made my world because I was just like Oprah just introduced herself <laughs> to me, like, <laughs> and then she was just one of the nicest people I've ever come across and to yeah. this day it has stayed with me that she didn't mm. have to do that she didn't mm-hmm. have to take a minute. She didn't have to introduce herself. Like, who doesn't know who damn Oprah is? <laughs> right? she I'm like, I, I know who you are. <laughs> yes. But, you know, and I've mm-hmm. had other experiences of people who I have admired. There was an author who I really loved. She's passed away and I don't want to ever, mm-hmm. you know, put shade on any other woman. But I remember our first interaction and it was just so awful Mm. it made me feel this big Mm. and I remember just going home and I just took every single one of her books off of my shelf and I gave it away Mm. and I never ever after that watch any kind of interview with her because I was like you get off on making people feel small and I don't know what that is about you but I can't support anything you do if that's how you move through the world just because you have the power to Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I've just like, I never, ever want anybody to have a memory of me like that. Yeah. Right. I, I just always want people to say, wow, you know, and what does it take to say hello? Thank you. Nice to meet you. Like, what does it really take from you? Mm-hmm. So and that is one of the things that I always say to young people coming up. Treat people with care and decency because you just don't know right? What people are going through and also where they're going to be 10 years, 20 years from now. You don't know where they're going to end up. You really don't. Yeah. You really don't. Yeah. You know, I think about legacy. Yeah. When you, when you say that, Trey, legacy, what do we want to leave? Yes. You know, when it's our time. When it's our time. Yeah. yeah. What, what do we want to leave? Yeah. And what I, I say about you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I do have a question around that. Um, but can I come back to Oprah for just a minute? Yes. <laughs> I could talk about Oprah all day. Like we could do a whole Oprah. <laughs> like I want to talk about Oprah any day, every minute, every hour, every second. I'm just a little bit obsessed about her. <laughs> oh my goodness, you're making my mascara run. Because I, yes, I have a question for you about legacy, but I would love to come back to Oprah for just a moment because one of my favorites as well. And when I, I, I I look at the platform that, that Oprah has, the amount of people that she reaches, and I can only imagine the hardships the hits, the mountains that we were speaking of, mm-hmm. that uh, that Oprah has encountered in order to get to where she is today. Mm-hmm. But to know that she took a moment to say hello. Yeah. In yeah. the bathroom of all places. By the way, I need to know where that bathroom is because I'm going to make sure. <laughs> that I'm, that I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to... I just want to hang out there just in, just in case in I case. get a chance to bump into Oprah. <laughs> Oprah. Oprah has a weak bladder. She's always there just hanging out. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. But the, the fact that Oprah took some time yeah, to just stop and pause mm-hmm. and say hi yeah. and hello. And so when you think about your legacy, Trey Anthony, your legacy you know, mm. I think it's, I, I, I sometimes don't, I remember a time I didn't like to think about this question mm-hmm. because the idea of Nicole not being here yeah. is so 
far off and it feels far off and, and strange and odd to talk mm -hmm. about. But I realize the older that I'm getting that it's okay for me to say, yeah, this is, okay. this is the legacy. Yeah, this is what I want to leave. This is, what, this is the message that mm -hmm. I want to share. Mm -hmm. And so if you'll permit me to ask you, what mm -hmm. is that legacy for Trey? What do you want to leave? What message do you want to? And you shared it in so many different ways, so beautifully. I'm just curious if you could bring it together and tell me, what, what does Trey Anthony want to say? What's mm -hmm. your legacy that you want to leave? I really think for me, it's around making, especially Black women, feel seen and heard and cared for and letting them know that we need to be tender with each other. We need to be supportive of each other. We need to recreate spaces for ourselves because we're not often given safe spaces. Mm. So for me, I'm always hoping in everything and the work that I do that I'm creating safe space for Black women to show up with. And I always say I'm unapologetically Black, right? Unapologetically. I never, when people are always like, well, what about mainstream? And, you know, how are other women going to relate to this? I said, that's up to them. <laughs> that's up to them, <laughs> right? Because I know I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support of Black women, right? And I also do believe, though, in that if you come from a place of authenticity and care and compassion, people will find themselves in your work regardless of race, regardless of class, regardless of sexuality, regardless of gender, because you come from the place of everybody wants to feel loved and heard and seen. And so for me, that's what I want is for people to show up and go, she actually cared. Mm. She cared. And I feel that in every sentence that she writes, I feel it in everything that she says. I feel it when I'm around her. I see how she functions with other people. And I just want to hold people with a, lend, a, a level of tenderness, right? And I do that because I also want the world to respond to me in that way too. And I think whatever you give out will come back to you. So yeah. I've always pretty much, I will say that people have been tender with me and careful with me and respectful with me. And of course, there's always the odd person who's having a bad day. But I would say the majority of times people have held me in that level of reverence. And it's, I think, because I give that to people, you know, and it's something I, I say now, especially being a mom, one of the things that I've said is. I want to raise a child who's a compassionate child. Yes. I don't care if he's a doctor or if he's a lawyer or if he becomes like the most famous person in the world, but I want him to be able to walk through the world with a level of compassion for others, mm. right? So that's what's important to me, right? That people will say, I truly believe she cared, right? And that is something that is important to me, like a level of empathy, a level of care for people. Because yes. I don't see that enough for others. You know, we just don't. Mm. Trey, you are speaking my language right yeah. now. Thank you for speaking such a beautiful love language. It really is. And it's such a wonderful way to wrap this conversation with you. I have to tell you, Trey Anthony, you are joy. <laughs> You are joy, you are kindness, you are goodness, you are love wrapped in love. Oh, Wrap, thank wrapped, you. Wrapped in, a tw wrapped in a Twinkie, a Twinkie <laughs> chocolate wrapper. What do you call it? What were those Twinkie? Oh my gosh, maybe you want to come off my diet now. <laughs> I was like, what <laughs> were those, those Twinkie things that I used to, oh no, not Twinkies. They were turtles, turtles chocolates. I Ooh, love turtles okay, chocolates. I'll take, I'll take it. Yes, you are love, Trey Anthony. You are love. Thank you so much for bringing um, this joy to this space today. I've so enjoyed chatting with you and um, and learning from you. And I'm I'm encouraged by you as well, just in hearing those words of compassion and care and how you deliver them. So thank you for all of the work, not only the work that you're doing, not only the work, Trey, but thank you for the love and, the, and the spirit that you are putting out there into the world. I have so much appreciation 
for you. Thank you. And thank yeah. you so much for having me. And this is amazing work that you're doing. And I can't wait to see the finished results. So thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Oh, it's it's yeah. a pleasure. I, I will tell you, I have to give um, wonderful credit to the beautiful folks at Amani, including yes. Tamia Wharton Surrey and mm -hmm. Kai um, for pulling this all together and, and yeah. inviting me as well. And so, yeah, I just, I, I almost don't want to leave this conversation. I, <laughs> I don't because I'm trying to figure out ways of how do I keep, how do I keep trying this conversation? How do I, how do, I do it? Because yeah, you've, you've really, you've touched my heart today and it's just been true joy speaking with you. So thank you for sharing your heart. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for joining us for today's conversation at the Imani Project. I'm Nicole Inika Hamilton.